Thank you. Um, okay, can I, everyone can hear me, yeah. Um, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. I know some of them are in the other room, so hello. Um, okay, uh, this, the title of this talk is a little vague, so what in arithmetic statistics uh, are we talking about? Um, we'll be talking about vaguely rational points on uh, families of algebraic curves. Um, so I thought I would give some background and motivation And I'm very happy that uh, Ross talked about some of the stuff I'll be saying in this background section. So I'll just kind of refer back to Ross's talk uh, as we go along. So I hope everyone paid a lot of attention. Um, but the broad goal is to understand uh, the rational points on a curve C as C varies over some family of curves. And the broad method, which um, Ross didn't really talk about, but we'll talk about some more, uh, is to count orbits in some related representation. Okay, and so this really is broad. I mean, I haven't really told you any details yet, but um, I thought we would look at sort of the primordial example to get a sense of what I'm talking about here. So this will be uh, the work that Ross mentioned uh, by Bhargava and Shankar. From 2010. So again, just to give you the setup. So let's have an elliptic curve E. of the same kind that Ross wrote down before, so these A and B are integers. It's an elliptic curve over the rationals. Um, and Bhargava and Schenker were looking at what the average rank was. Um, and they, so okay. So right, so the ordering they used was slightly different from the one Ross said, but because it's not important for the rest of the talk, we won't make a big deal out of it. Um, but they proved the following theorem which is that the average size of the two Selmer group for these elliptic curves over Q is equal to three. And the thing that's most important for the rest of the talk isn't the theorem itself, but the method of proof. Like how did they prove this theorem? Okay, so um, let's set up some notation. So I'll have to talk about a representation. Um, so I'm gonna let P4, this will be homogeneous uh, degree four polynomials in two variables. Um, this has a natural action of PGL2 acting on the two variables. Um, and this action is defined over the integers, right? So we can base change to whatever field we want. Okay, if we look at, so I wanna look at the polynomials on P4 over Q um, that are fixed under this action of PGL2, so the invariant polynomials. Um, this is a polynomial ring in two variables. Oh, sorry, that should be a Q. Uh, that are normally called I and J, so I is degree two and J is degree three. Okay, 
So the key facts which was proven by Birch and Swinnerton Dyer, is that for our elliptic curve E uh, written up there, the elements of the two, the two Selmer group of E are in bijection with certain of these degree four polynomials. So it's, um, So these degree four polynomials, I want to take coefficients in Z. I want them to be uh, what are called locally soluble. Uh, again, the exact definition is not going to be important for the rest of the talk. Um, such that, so it's such that when I take I of F, I get this coefficient A from my elliptic curve, and when I take J of F, I get this coefficient B from my elliptic curve. And I wanted uh, to take really equivalence classes where two polynomials are in the same equivalence class if they're in the same orbit under the action of PGL2Q. Um, okay, so what Bhargava and Shankar did was count orbits. Here and so they and they developed methods for counting these orbits. So they developed these methods that have been used then in like lots of different situations to understand different families of curves by counting integral orbits in certain representations. And in the first version of this talk, I then like had like three different examples where I had like here's my family of curves, here's the related representations, and then I realized it was taking way too long. So um, you can just trust me on this, but. Let's talk about what's going to happen for the rest of the talk. So the broad uh, the broad theme for the rest of the talk is we want to be able to zoom out. So so the questions I'm asking are like first of all, the representations that show up. Uh, when you're looking at families of curves, how can we kind of understand or classify these representations? So, um, um, and the second question. Right, so I said before, like, what's the method? Is counting orbits in a related representation. So what does this related mean? So in general, in like the papers of Bhargava and Shankar and other papers in this field, we're using sort of classical relationships in algebraic geometry um, to go from our family of curves to the related representation. Um, so like this fact by Birch and Swinnerton Dyer. Um, but is there a natural way, if you give me a family of curves, to then produce a representation? Is there a way that doesn't kind of depend on uh, these deep theorems in algebraic geometry? So two is, oh, is there a natural, a natural construction that starts with a family of curves all right, I'm very short, so the board has to be very low. I'm hoping, so if you can't see things, let me know. It will, they'll slide up anyway. That starts with the family of curves. And then produces a group G acting on a representation B. And so I'll tell you like the broad answers now, and then we'll spend the rest of the talk kind of looking into these broad answers. Um, so, they're sort of partial answers, I should say. Um, so the first is that we can think of all of the representations pretty much that show up as coming from what are called graded Lie algebras. So we can use graded Lie algebras. 
So I'm gonna have to tell you what a gridded Lie, Lie algebra is because I think like people here aren't really experts on them. Um, and we'll see how they do show up. And then the second thing, so is a construction that I wanna talk about, kind of the new construction that we'll talk about today. Um, and the idea is that, say, okay, so let's call this family like F. So you start with a curve C and F. In some cases, you can then form a Heisenberg group of a certain form. Uh, this is often using like Mum Mumford theta groups to get uh, these Heisenberg groups. And then what I will talk about is a construction that goes from a Heisenberg group to a graded Lie algebra. So that will be kind of the new thing we talk about today. And then there's a very natural way to go from a graded Lie algebra to a group acting on a representation. Okay, so right, the next thing is to talk about graded Lie algebras, so what are they? Um, but any questions before we start that? Okay, let's keep going. Uh, No, I think I read on the top one first. Okay. So here's part two. Let's talk about graded Lie algebras. So here's sort of the general construction, the general way we form graded Lie algebras. Let's start with um, H, a connected reductive group. Uh, the ones we'll be using are just gonna be like Chevalet groups, so defined over the integers. So you can think of like SLN or SON, um, whatever, or E8 will come up later. Um, and we'll, st we'll take an automorphism of this group of order M, um, and let's let Zeta, uh, Oh, maybe I'll define this now for the rest of the talk. So zeta m will be a primitive mth root of unity. Um, so one thing I'll say is that, okay, so you might be worried, like what if I start with a group over um, the rationals, then I don't necessarily have an mth root of unity. Um, all of the the algebras we'll be looking at are actually, the gradings will be defined over the integers. So um, we kind of are taking this, we're kind of working over an algebraically closed field maybe, but then everything gives you, um, gives you representations and groups over the rationals or over whatever field you started with. So kind of don't worry too much about that. So here's how it works. So if you have this, um, this automorphism theta, what can we do first? So first, um, let's take the fixed points in our group H, and then if this is not connected, we'll take the identity component. Um, let's call this uh, G. So this will be another connected reductive group. And then uh, if you have theta, you also end up with an automorphism of the Lie algebra. So this is automorphism H. Uh, where H is the Lie algebra of my group H. Um, and then let's let H sub J uh, be the zeta to the Jth, or zeta M to the Jth uh, eigenspace for D theta. Um, so then my graded Lie algebra, so I can take H, is the direct sum over j and z mod mz of hj. This is a graded Lie algebra. Um, we'll see an example in a second, but 
I promised you that there's a natural way to go from gradedly algebras to certain uh, groups and representations. So this G will be my group. Um, and then G has a natural action on each of the eigenspaces because it's the fixed point subgroup. And so it acts on H1, which will be a representation D. Um, let's do an example, just so this is a bit more concrete. So say we start with H equal, SL, equal to SL3. And I'll define my theta to be the inverse transpose of a matrix. Okay, so what are the fixed points under this? This is exactly um, the special orthogonal group. So uh, G is equal to SO3. And SO3 is, of course, isomorphic to PGL2. And then if you look at the decomposition of the Lie algebra, then you get H1 is isomorphic to P4 as a representation of PGL2. So you get exactly uh, the representation that Bergava and Shankar were looking at uh, before. Um, and in general, uh, you can like just kind of look through papers by Bhargava and his collaborators and be like, okay, this comes from this gradedly algebra, this comes from this gradedly algebra. They weren't using this fact though, right? So one thing you might wonder is like, why would I wanna think of these things as coming from gradedly algebras? Like, right, why I have perfectly good representations, like why think of them as coming from this? Uh, P4, yeah, I mean, it's the dual of that, but. Yeah, so the symmetric fourth power. Oh, sorry. The question was, oh, P4, yeah, sorry, I defined it up there. It's homogeneous degree four polynomials in two variables. Yeah, the question was, what is P4, right? Um, yeah, it's homogeneous degree four polynomial, polynomials in two variables, or you can think about it as uh, the dual of the symmetric fourth power of the standard uh, two-dimensional representation of uh, SL2, I guess, and the action factors through PGL2. Okay, so, right, so as I was saying, and so, oh, one thing I should mention, so Gross wrote this paper where he actually does go through and shows like which graded Lie algebra each of these representations comes from. So if you wanna know more about like where they come from, you can look at that. But the question we were just saying was, um, why think of these? As coming from graded Lie algebras. And the answer is that you have a lot more structure to work with. So you can use Lie theory, like the structure coming from Lie theory in your proofs. Um, so you can use, um, you can use structure and, and the theorems. From Lie theory in your proofs. And just to give an example of what you can do using these combined techniques. Um, I'll just, I'll state a theorem that I proved uh, in collaboration with Jack Thorne using kind of Lie theory as our approach. So let's let F be the family of genus two hyperelliptic curves uh, C with a marked rational wire stress point. So you can think of these as just coming from uh, degree five polynomials. So y squared equals degree five polynomial. Um, so, right, and you can, again, I'm not gonna make a big deal out of like the partial ordering uh, we put on it, but 
uh, you can see, I guess, our paper for details, but basically you can define a partial ordering with respect to the coefficients of this degree five polynomial. Um, so what we proved was that the average size of the three Selmer group for the curves in this family, um, oh sorry, of the Jacobian of C for the curves in this family is equal to four. So where JC is the Jacobian for curve C. Okay, and the way we did this was to look at a three graded the algebra of type E8. So, you might think, okay, like where's the Lie theory coming in? To give you an example, um, right? So when you're doing this kind of Bargava uh, type, uh, these Bargava type proofs where you're counting orbits, there's always this issue with like the cusp region, like cutting off the cusp. Um, so when we were looking at uh, our, our representation as living inside of a Lie algebra of type E8, there is a Lie theoretic um, definition of the cusp region. And then our curves we are thinking about in terms of regular semi-simple elements inside the Lie algebra. So right, so like when we were doing our counting, we only needed to count kind of regular semi-simple elements. And this is, this is a definition in terms of Lie theory, right? It's a definition in terms of centralizers. We were thinking about centralizers of semi-simple elements in a Lie algebra. And that like, right, so, this is a graded Lie algebra, I would say it's an M graded Lie algebra if it has M pieces. Graded, yeah, th graded in, in three pieces is all it means. Yeah, so we were really thinking, oh sorry, the question, sorry for the other people in the other room, the question was what is a three grading? It's just the number of pieces in the grading is three. Um, yeah, so we're really like, you just have like more tools to work with, right, if you think about things in terms of like a larger structure is the theme. Okay, um, oh, I also wanted to mention as another example of kind of using graded Lie algebras in this context, uh, you should look at the work of, uh, of Jeff Laga, who's here at the, at the workshop. He's written a couple of beautiful papers um, kind of using graded Lie algebras in this context. So yeah, so read his papers if you want more examples. Um, okay, so, right, so kind of that's, I think that's all I wanted to say so far about graded Lie algebras. Yeah, okay, so what I wanna do next, oh, okay. So what I wanted to do next is talk about this new construction. So let's, Uh, which as I wrote up there, so it's the one that started over there, kind of the Heisenberg group degraded the algebra construction. So what I wanna do is state this sort of theorem slash construction, um, which is purely algebraic. And then I wanna convince you that kind of this algebraic data actually shows up naturally when you're looking at families of curves. Um, so this is uh, work of me, but I was generalizing previous work by uh, Jacob Lurie um, and previous work by Thorne and also previous work by myself and Thorne, which I won't list as kind of separate. Um, so I'll tell you what the input is.
Okay, so let's make a list. So the first thing is I want lambda to be a simply laced root lattice. I'll remind you what that is a bit more later, um, if you don't remember. Um, two, I want an automorphism W of this root lattice. So this would be an, automorph an elliptic automorphism. I'll remind you of what this means of order M. Okay, and then the third thing I want is this uh, Heisenberg group of the sort I talked about before. So um, I want a central extension of the following form. So I want ooh, to switch my talk. So one mu m uh, h, so it's gonna be an extension of lambda mod one minus w lambda, where w is that automorphism we had. Okay, this is my input, and this probably like means nothing to a lot of you, so we're gonna, I'm gonna show you where it comes up in a second, but just to say a few more words about um, what these things are. So, right, so elliptic, you probably are wondering what this means. This just means that this quotient, lambda mod one minus w lambda is finite. Um, okay, so that's what that means. Um, root lattices, I'll talk about this in a second. Yeah, a central extension, I mean it, you maybe know what this means already, so. <laughs> okay, so maybe you won't say that. Um, okay. So I'll put that up there and I'll do some board washing, but what I'm gonna write next is that given this input data, we have a canonical construction of a Lie algebra with a Z mod MZ grading, so a grading with into M pieces. And while I'm washing the board, I'll just tell you why you should be impressed by this. <laughs> so. Okay, so if you want to define, if you want to construct a Lie algebra, what do you do? You take some basis of a vector space and you have to define a Lie bracket on it. So this bilinear map. And if you're working with semi-simple Lie algebras, this comes to, down to choosing what are called structure constants for your Lie algebra. And the structure constants are basically just like the coefficients that come up when you're taking the bracket of basis elements. Now, it's a hard problem in Lie theory to choose structure constants consistently. So there, in general, there's no canonical way to choose structure constants. Um, so the fact that this construction gives you a canonical Lie bracket that only depends on this input data. Um, I mean, that's like, that's impressive from a Lie theoretic point of view. Like it's hard in general to, uh, to come up with a canonical way to define a Lie bracket for a semi-simple Lie algebra. So this is sort of, I have a canonical construction of a Lie algebra with a, to like choose the structure, right? So one, two, three, it like, they give you the structure constants. Yeah. Um, yeah, nowadays you can, like magma has structure constants built into it, but somehow when we're, I'm just gonna wash two boards at once to make sure that they're dry. Um, but for like, for this kind of application, you really want a canonical way to do it. Really, you really like need to know that you've gone like from your curves 
to the representation without adding any extra choices. So Lurie did this for, yeah, so okay. Um, he was looking, I mean, his works for any simply laced root lattice, um, yeah, any simply laced root lettuce, and he gets a, he gives a two grading. So he was looking specifically um, at certain order two automorphisms of a simply laced root lattice. Sorry, he only does my, yeah okay. So he does W equals. I guess that's yeah okay. So he he does W equals minus one, um, and then. Right, with the intention of using it to look at what certain surfaces, is that right, Jeff? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, right, he, he wanted to give a canonical construction of E6, okay. Yeah, and so then what Jack did in another paper was kind of extend his construction. Um, and like to get more information out of it. And then Jack used this one looking at um, certain, it was certain two gradings of E6 and E7. And then Jack and I extended it uh, just to get the three, a three graded Lie algebra of type E8. So we extended it just to like, when we were working on this theorem that I stated, just like in one specific case, but it turns out you can, Generalize it even further. Okay. And what's interesting about um, when we were doing this, like even for the just the three grading, not the general theorem that I'm in the middle of writing, um, we like didn't know how to do it for a long time. We were stuck in this for ages, um, and. The key ended up being in this paper about like twisted vertex operator algebras. It was like a theoretical physics paper. That was like where we like finally were like, aha, if we do like something like this, then we'll get it. So yeah, it was, it was weird. Okay, uh, where was I? So theorem construction. So given this input data, as I already said, uh, we have a natural, we also can canonical construction of, I forgot to say something before, but I'll, I'll just go back. Uh, so a uh, Lie algebra H of type given by Lambda, so if lambda is an E8 root lattice, you get a, a Lie algebra of type E8. Um, and, right, so the other thing is an automorphism theta of your Lie algebra of order M. Um, which then gives you the grading. Um, the thing I forgot to say up here, so the central extension, I actually want uh, one more condition on it. So I want the commutator pairing to be a specific natural pairing that shows up on this. So I'll just write a little note here. So with commutator pairing, Uh, the natural, I'll put a little asterisk one um, and then say what I mean. So, okay, so this natural pairing, uh, you can see, okay, so this natural pairing, basically when you're looking at 
uh, this root lettuce and this, uh, the co-invariance over there. There's a natural pairing that comes up. It came up in like the 1960s in this paper on twisted vertex operator algebras by Lepowski. And then actually Mark Reeder wrote a paper where he was looking at this and he defined what he thought was a different pairing and it ends up being the same pairing. That's like one of the things, like when I was looking at this, I realized that they were the same and proved it. So there's just kind of, so when you say natural, I mean, it's the one that seems to like keep coming up and you'll see um, later it comes up as, um, as the Vey pairing. So yeah, that will be in the example. So you can see the Pasky or reader. Um, I should also say that you get a Lie algebra, what field is it over? It would naturally be over the Q adjoining the mth roots of unity, um, but because the structure constants end up having some zetas that are coming from, from mu m. Uh, but then uh, if you have a Galois action, basically you can take uh, Galois invariance and get a Lie algebra over whatever you want over Q. Okay, um, and I'll also say like, okay, so I said that I have this canonical way of defining the structure constants. The key is to basically use multiplication in H in this central extension to define the structure constants. Um, and if there's time at the end, I'll say a little bit more about how the construction works, but the key is like H kind of, the multiplication in H gives you a way to define the structure constants. Okay, but the thing you're probably most interested in is like, we have this weird input data, like does it actually show up when we're looking at um, families of algebraic curves? So, so where does this input appear? And I want to give you sort of a family of examples. So, Let's start with, oh, okay, so in these examples, we'll work over an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero, but again, we can, and it's just like for convenience, so I don't say anything wrong, right? But then you can use sort of um, this Galois descent to get uh, things over irrationals. So let's work over K algebraically closed characteristic zero. Okay, and we're gonna look at the following singular surface over K, which is of the form X to the fifth plus Y cubed plus Z squared equals zero. So this is um, called a simple singularity of type E8. Um, because I like E8, I mean, so. <laughs> uh, okay, and you can take what's called a semi-universal deformation of this singularity, uh, which gives you, I'll, sh I'll tell you a bit about what this means. So this is semi-universal. deformation, so it's over affine eight-dimensional space, uh, and this is what this looks like. So say we take lambda equal to like C1, C2, up to C8. Um, the fiber uh, over lambda looks like the following surface. So I'll call it S lambda. Okay, so it looks like this. X to the fifth uh, plus Y cubed plus Z squared again. And then this is plus Y times C1 X cubed plus C2 uh, X squared plus C3 X plus C4 plus um, C5 X cubed plus C6 X squared plus C7 X plus C8. 
right? So every, uh, for every eight tuple, you get a surface. Um, some of them will be singular. Basically, we throw out the singular ones. We only, we only care about the smooth ones. Um, but the important fact is that uh, if S lambda is smooth, Uh, then the Picard group of S lambda is it's isomorphic to a uh, root lattice of type E8. Um, so now I was promised I'll like say a little bit more about what that means, so you know what to think about so lambda a root lattice of type e8 so uh, it's a lattice in eight dimensional space that's generated by the characters of a maximal torus of a group of type e8 so is no, I don't want that there. So is generated And the other thing to note is that on a root lattice, there's a natural pairing, a symmetric pairing coming from the killing form in the early algebra. Um, so it has a natural symmetric pairing. So when I say that this Picard group is a root lattice of type E8, I mean there's an isomorphism of lattices and it sends this pairing coming from the killing form to a certain intersection pairing on the Picard group. Um, okay, so notice, so far, we have the first item on our list of inputs. So this gives us item one. Of course, we don't have families of curves yet, so that's like not quite what I promised, but uh, basically what's gonna happen next is we're gonna take certain automorphisms of S and that will give us both curves and um, item two on the list of inputs. So here's what the automorphisms are. I think I'll just write up here. Um, so let's define, so we'll define three different automorphisms. of S, um, okay, the way we'll define them, so basically uh, what I'll call theta five, we'll send X to a fifth root of unity times X. My uh, theta three will send Y to a cubed root of unity times Y. Um, my theta five will send Z to minus z, and these all extend to give you automorphisms. Yeah, I said five twice. Why, because it should go two, three, four, but then it should go x, y, z, I, yeah. Okay. It's like if I don't write them with these up there, I get confused, so. <laughs> um, okay, so these extend and give you automorphisms of s, and let's, um, let's now fix, uh, S lambda, uh, to, let's pick a smooth surface, and we want it to be preserved by theta m. And we'll see examples in a second. Um, but the thing to note is that if we take su such an S lambda, then we get uh, an elliptic automorphism uh, 
I'll call it W sub M uh, of the Picard group. And then since the Picard group is isomorphic to uh, simply list the algebra, oh sorry, simply list root lattice of type E8, this gives us item two on our list. Um, it's a priori, you don't know that the automorphism is elliptic, so I guess I could state that as like a lemma that I proved is that you can, so you can check that you get an elliptic automorphism. Um, okay. So, what do I wanna do now? So I, I promised you families of curves and basically just inside of this S lambda, a lambda you take the fixed point curve. So let C lambda be the fixed points. Under theta sub M. Um, we're gonna see examples of what comes out so you'll have like something, you know, to think about in the back of your mind. Uh, but I'll, I'll wash first. Actually, as an exercise while I'm washing the board, you can figure out what you get, what like C lambda looks like if, if M is three or if M is five. Maybe I can ask a question. Yeah. Um, the, the fact that these give you automorphisms of S is something to do with it being this semi-universal definition. Of and they, they clearly act on this central fiber. They act on the central fiber and then they extend. Yeah, why do they? Um, I remember it as not being hard to check. Yeah, uh, but I don't, I don't remember the details at the moment. I guess I'll do another one. The first time I gave a talk where I had to wash boards, I really didn't like it because I felt like I was just getting into my stride and then I had to stop, but now I'm kind of enjoying it. I think it's, it's, it gives everyone a chance to breathe, kind of absorb information, to do the exercise that I just set you. There is some danger of like falling on this water. Okay, well. Okay, so let's do some, let's do the exercise that I just set you. Um, let's do M equals five first. Okay, so for M equals five, um, S lambda So let S lambda is preserved by uh, theta five if and only if it takes the following form. Okay, so um, 
Okay, so what can happen? So, right, so we need all of these coefficients, C1 through C3 to be zero, um, but C4 is okay, so we get plus C4, Y plus C8. And then if we take uh, the fixed points, you get back an elliptic curve. Well, you take the projected completion and then you get an elliptic curve. Um, so using this, we get the family of elliptic curves over Q. Um, so if M equals three, okay, so then uh, S lambda, what can happen? So uh, all of these coefficients, C1 through C4 have to be zero. So I get X to the fifth plus Y cubed plus Z squared plus um, this degree three polynomial. So uh, here's, this is still wet over here, so I'll write it over here. Um, okay, and then if you take the fixed points, uh, so what happens, so this Y goes away um, and you get back, oh, I'm like avoiding the damp patches, that's why it looks kind of funny. So you get back um, the genus two hyperelliptic curves um, with a marked rational wire stress point. So you get back uh, both of the families we've mentioned already in this talk. Uh, okay, but we need to keep going because we need the rest of this input. Oh, and I erased it. Okay, but do you remember what it is you've been taking notes? Okay, uh, so the last thing is, oh, if you do the M equals two, I mean, it's like messy to write out, right? But you get um, certain non-hyperelliptic curves that Jack and I wrote a paper about once. Uh, okay, so we need this Heisenberg group, basically. We need this central extension. Uh, so the first thing to notice and let me make sure I've got all my ducks in a row for this. Ah, okay. So this was proven in the M equals two case uh, by Zarin, uh, so the M equals three case was uh, myself and uh, Jack, and the M equals five case is easy, uh, which is that there, so I'm gonna take, right, so in each case we get curves, I'll take, uh, C lambda to be the corresponding projective curve uh, that you get from the affine curves in each case. Um, so in each case, there is an isomorphism Okay, so from this group of co-invariants, Oh, M, that's what I was using. Uh, two, so take the M torsion of the Jacobian of one of these projective curves. Um, and, and it intertwines the natural pairing here that we talked about with the they pairing here. And in each case, um,
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I guess like when do I use the word intertwining with, oh, th sorry, the question for those in the other room was, um, does intertwining mean identifying? And yeah, it does. So for example, so right, so if you take the pairing of two things here um, with respect to the natural pairing, then take their images and take that pairing, that will be the they pairing of those two things. Okay, and so uh, in each case, uh, we can also, I guess that's like the end of the class too, but in each case we can define uh, a central extension of the M torsion of the Jacobian. with commutator pairing given by the V pairing. So in the case of these two examples, so M equals five and M equals uh, Three, this is, you use Mumford theta groups and basically you have to take like the M torsion and a certain Mumford theta group uh, to get it. And then in the M equals two case, uh, this is work of Thorne uh, using a theta characteristic. Um, okay, and, but the nice thing is that this gives us exactly uh, the third point in our input, right? Because this Jacobian, as we said in fact two, this is isomorphic to the, the co-invariance. And then we wanted the commutator pairing to be the natural one. So that gives us exactly the input for this construction. And I think I'll stop there, so thank you. Thank you very much for a very clear talk. Hello, questions? Yeah, okay, sure. Um, the question was... Uh, so the question was, what is the result? main result I wanted to talk about? So then, I mean, the main result I wanted to talk about was this, uh, this construction that goes from certain Heisenberg groups, I mean, this, from the three input uh, points to a uh, graded the algebra. Um, but rather than talk about kind of the proof of the result and like how the construction works, I thought people would be more interested in seeing that the input actually arises. Uh, Ah, so in, okay, ah, okay, this is, this is a very good point. Here's what I'll say. So in the M equals three case, um, Jack and I used this construction, I mean, a special case of it that we had done, uh, in order to prove that result about the Selmer groups of genus uh, two curves. So this was a crucial part of our paper. Um, in the M equals five case, I should have said this, but you actually, if you do this construction, you get out precisely um, the group and the representation that Bhargava and Shankar used when they were finding uh, five Selmer, the average size of the five Selmer group for elliptic curves. So you get back kind of the natural thing. Um, in the M equals two case, um, Jack and I have like, we have sort of, I guess, we have some results in that case. Um, what we have is kind of results about integral points because uh, we couldn't, the issue in that case was it's hard to, find integral orbit representatives. And so we like, that was kind of the step we were missing and what we did. So we have results, but we don't have like the average size of the Selmer groups in that case. Yeah. Yeah. This 
this is a good question. So the question was, um, can we, using grade, like graded Lie algebras, kind of bypass the cutting off the cusp? The answer is no, but it makes it easier because you have more um, kind of more theorems, more structure at your disposal. So like when we were doing it for E8, we were, uh, for this, these genus uh, two curves, we were using everywhere the fact that we were linking at like centralizers of semi-simple elements. Basically when you're, when you're cutting off the cusp, it's important to know like when you have smooth curves and when you have stuff that you can just throw away. And like the stuff we could throw away was because the centralizers and the Lie algebra were too big. So, so it's not that it's not that we can bypass it. It's that you have kind of more tools at your disposal when you're doing it. Any more questions? So these are three kind of obvious automorphisms of S. Are there other automorphisms and families that you can say things about as a result, or is this? I mean, obviously you have the product of the three, for example, but I guess that. Yeah, um, I don't know if there are other automorphisms. Like, right, so there's, I mean, you could, you could go looking, basically. Uh, so for, in general, there are like lists of the elliptic automorphisms of uh, a simply laced root lattice. So you could kind of look at that list and see what's left um, to do, basically. Yeah.